Hi everybody and welcome to our first introduction talk about financial management. One of the things that you'll be getting an email from me going over all the different readings I'd like you to do over the next week or two and this is the first lecture of financial management. There's a second lecture to financial management and then finally we will be talking about um, some exercises in financial management and so I want to um, start out that this is not an easy thing to begin with but it's a very important one and I guarantee you between now and next semester you'll feel very confident in understanding this and some of the exercises we're going to do is we're going to uh, initially just evaluate a current pharmacy and then at the end of the semester what are in-class exercise where we do a live presentation, you're going to evaluate the value of a pharmacy and all that it means. I am going to be posting a couple uh, additional uh, video vignettes from uh, Mr. Olin Sykes, the CPA that does help a lot of pharmacies with financial management. Um, so please read those and um, look forward to uh, having this discussion. Once again, if you have any questions about this, um, please feel free to uh, ask me. I am not going to initially, I'm going to post some discussion questions um, next week uh, for you to take a look at. But this week, I want you just to really, I know your schedule's busy, so take time and read some of the chapter readings I gave you and follow the video, okay? All right, so let's begin. All right, so our objective for this lecture is we're going to explain the dynamic relationship that, ex that exists between a balance sheet and the income statement, outline how using financial analysis as a tool to improve profits and increase cash flow, and discuss a pharmacy's financing needs. So what do you need to know for a pharmacy business? Oh, my account can do it. And, and I, I've said before in numerous lectures that, you know, a pharmacy owner, the two most important things that you need to hire is a CPA, you know, a certified, you know, uh, public accountant, and a lawyer. However, you don't want to just hand over all that for them to do. You want to be able to, how can I take those finances and analyze how my business is doing? How do I conduct a complete and thorough financial analysis of it? How do I identify any real potential problems? And how do I solve these problems for the future? How do I develop budgets and financial statements which I will need for a business plan and need when I'm submitting to get funding from a bank or an investor? I always look at financial analysis and pharmacy similar to, you know, what we should be doing for our health. So fiscal exam which is our financial analysis of our business and physical exam of analyzing how our body is doing. So what are things we do? We take our blood pressure. We look at where that is. We take, we get our sugars to look at where that is. We check our hemoglobin A1C. We check our renal function. We check our liver function. We check our electrolytes. The same thing is occurring in financial analysis. You are trying to analyze what do I do with my, how my pharmacy is doing. One of the things that happens in the banking world, though, too, is that you could have a traditional community pharmacy business, you could have a grocery store business, and you could have, you know, an online internet business. The one thing that banks do is they do comparative analysis and ratio analysis, and it's a way to compare how your business is doing financially, sort of like, you know, I got apples and oranges, how do I compare those two? And so that is really what financial analysis occurring. So comparative analysis is often done in percentages and ratios and expresses a financial com component. And a lot of times these comparative analysis is based upon the most important thing of your business besides profit is your sales. If you don't have good sales, you're not going to have good profit. There's different types of financials that you will be working with. There's your income statement and your balance sheet. So let's talk initially about preparing financial statements. All right. So the three most important forms that your accountant will help get prepared for you is your profit loss statement, your balance sheet, and your cash flow statement. 
Your profit loss is the most valuable in business planning. It provides information of your income, your revenues, your expenses, as well as your profits. And this P&L can be done, most of the time will definitely be done on an annual basis, but you can use look at this from a month to month, quarter to quarter. The balance sheet and cash flow are more helpful with existing business. The balance sheet is going to report what assets you have in your company and what are your liabilities. So basically, what are, what do I owe and who do I owe? And the cash flow statement provides sources of how much cash do I have in my business because you could have a business that looks great on paper, but then when you go to look into your bank account, where is my cash? Data input, all right, a lot of times in preparing financials, you know, there are startup costs. You're going to, uh, when you're doing forecasting, you're going to anticipate what your annual unit of service volume is. You're also going to determine what you're going to get paid, and sometimes what you get paid is not always up to you. It's based on third-party payer mixes. The other thing in planning for preparing financials, you're going to also factor in inflation salary increases and drug price increases so things you need to think about in preparing financials what are the financial projections for my venture in the first five years how do these projections compare to the industry norm what is the projected margin for this program one of the things that's nice in our field of business in independent community pharmacy is that there is yearly put out by the ncpa um uh, organization a financial digest now I'm going to be putting on the website an older digest it's several years old and the reason why is NCPA does release them now year to year but you actually have to be a member and a participating person when we get into your business plans next semester I will share the current data with you okay a well-designed financial plan helps you stay focused on track despite a lack of profits the most important goals is determining the funds you may need to for startup. The financing needs helps depend on factors such as the industry, the experience of you as an entrepreneur, where you're possibly going to locate your business, and what are the inventory requirements. Each new venture needs funds to cover startup expenses, and the, must, the entrepreneur must obtain sufficient seed capital. In the startup stage for entering into an accounting system, the entrepreneur estimates the financials. It's achieved through the pro forma, and the, like I said, there's those three financial statements, the profit loss statement, the cash flow statement, and the balance statement. In a business plan, entrepreneurs are required to provide a pro forma statement that estimates their operating activity for at least three to five years. One of the things in these things, you're going to estimate when you're going to get into profitability and how are you going to handle difficult times and what are investors lenders looking for in financials they're looking for the clarity of expression of your plan of how you're going to get there they're going to look at the consistency of your knowledge of what does your business look like to compare to other businesses out there your internal consistency and the comprehensiveness of you understanding your financial situation the sales forecast or the revenue estimate is necessary for an entrepreneur to provide the three basic financial statements. And so a lot of times you're thinking in units of volume. And I talked about this in Pharmacy Practice 6. And so you're going to look at what your price is. So, for example, there is information out there what the average price of a prescription is. Um, so, for example, that can vary anywhere from $55 and $65. Volume, you can determine how many prescriptions am I going to start out with. And so say that I'm filling 100 prescriptions per day and I'm open 30 days every month. All right. So, you know, if I, you know, if I project out, you know, a full year that I'm open every day out of the year, all right, and I know that that's not always the case, all right, but say that I am, all right, and I'm doing 100 prescriptions, you know, a day, so maybe I'm doing 100 prescriptions a day. Let's take 100 prescriptions a day times 30, all right, times 365, so I'm doing a million scripts a year. I times that by 55, 
I'm, I'm sorry, I did that wrong. Say I'm doing 100 scripts a day, so I'm doing 3,000 prescriptions a month. So that means I'm doing 36,000 scripts a year. I times that, say, by average prescription price, 55. That means I'm doing $1.9 million, all right? So that's how you project that. I actually do one thing that I talked to you about before about thinking about being an NCP member, and I will share some of these with you. They actually have a nice Excel spreadsheet in getting you to understand preparing financials that you can factor in what does it take till I get to my break even point in my business. The profit loss statement accurately states accurately and fairly the profit or loss operation for a giving accounting period, and all accountants have to follow what's called gap rules. And that is revenue of any accounting period should have the appropriate cost of acquiring that revenue attributed to the same accounting year. Revenue spent on any item that has a useful life of more than one year is considered a capital good, and that's considered a capital expense. So spreading the cost of capital goods over a period of its useful life is called depreciation. So what does that mean? So if I am selling penicillin, my penicillin is not going to last beyond a year. It's going to last maybe beyond a month, maybe a bottle of 500. And so therefore, I am only going to count that for that year. But maybe I purchase a new pharmacy system that is $30,000. Well, I can depreciate that over so many years. And so if I depreciate that over five years, then I'm only going to count $6,000 of, of that as revenue or that as an expense per year. And that actually can help you with your taxes. All the operating costs of the company must be included in one of three cost categories. It's either a cost of goods, it's a selling cost, or it's general administrative costs. Other categories that are in the profit loss statement are your gross profit, your gross margin, sales and marketing expense, profit or net income. If an entrepreneur has been diligent to include all revenue and expense items, the P&L statement provide a great deal of information about the health of the venture. The entrepreneur can avoid becoming overwhelmed by the complexity of the P&L statement by focusing on a few summary figures, the gross margin and the net income. I did provide you um, some great resources from Olin Sykes talking about gross margin. Please listen to that. There is actually a podcast that I'm sharing the web link to um, that comes from Pharmacy Podcast. Um, you can fast forward some of the just general banter that's in it, but listen to the key components they're talking about. And the two people talking in that talk is Olin Sykes and a gentleman from um, Live Oak Bank, which is actually a bank located in Virginia that, that actually helps finance pharmacies. The P&L statement provides numbers that tell the entrepreneur how to perceive he or she is doing from an accounting perspective. So let's look at what goes into a P&L statement. In simple format, you bring in revenue, which is your sales. It costs so much to do business, that's your expenses. Whatever left over, that's your net income. Revenues are earned from the sale of goods or services. Note that revenues occur when the sale is made. The payment may or may not have been received. So example, that happens in the pharmacy world. I make a sale of a prescription and I bill it out to a third-party insurance. However, I may not get paid by that third-party insurance anywhere from 30 to 45 days. Expenses are incurred when a business receives goods and services. Example expenses include salary, utility expense, and interest expense I may have to pay on loans that I have taken out. So, here's some things in our sales. So we got sales revenue minus cost of goods. That's our gross profit. Cost of goods is our, you know, our inventory, our purchases, minus operating expense, which includes salaries and utilities. And that, you know, then we may have some non-operating items, all right, which is like our utilities and electricity. And then we have income before taxes. And then after income taxes, we have net income. Cost, 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 cost of goods that a business secured to buy or make a product for, for resale. For example, a bookstore buys a book for $25 and sells it for $32. The cost of goods sold is $25. Operating expense are the usual expenses incurred in operating a business. Accountants such, accounts such as salary expense, utility expense, and depreciation expenses are all shown in this section. Non-operating items are, are revenue expenses, gains and losses do not relate to the company's primary operations. These may be interest expenses, gains and losses from sales of equipment or other investments we may have incurred. 
Income tax, obviously it's pretty self-explanatory. And like I said, depending upon how you do your business and, and where you're at in the stages of your business, sometimes offsetting costs different ways may help prevent paying more taxes. Example of a simplified P&L, if you take a look, here's a company that, you know, there's their net revenue, there's their total costs. The first year they lose money, second year they make some money, third year they do, but you carry that over of what your net or your profit is per year. You can make revenue projections based on all the different things you might be doing, such as clinical services, your prescription drug sales. And so you can have different sales item lines that could be prescription drugs, over-the-counter goods, diabetes classes, immunization. So you can break that down as much as you want. Because the other thing is you want to look at what is the, you know, bankers are going to look at, lenders are going to look at, you are going to look at what is my return on investment. And I did go into detail about this in Pharmacy Practice 6. And return on investment is the measure of growth of what I invest into my company, and banks are looking at that. So they're investing money into your company. What are they hoping? They're going to pay back interest, but they're hoping that your business is going to make a return on investment. The cash flow statement helps entrepreneurs manage cash, just like it says. In a new venture, cash management is critical. New ventures have often understaffed and undertrained accounting personnel. They're volatile to cash flows because we're a lot of times waiting to be paid by third-party insurances. And a significant portion of their net worth is tied up in working capital. These limitations are often compounded because you know, there's always that you know double-edged sword that I grow too slow so I don't bring in enough revenue. And I do grow too fast that you know I start incurring a lot of operating expense but I'm not bringing in enough cash because I'm not getting paid quick enough. Working capital is the amount which current assets exceed current liabilities. So fast growing and rising profits mean thin bank accounts. For most businesses, the relationship between sales assets is stable and predictable. The more rapid the rate of growth, the more complicated is the behavior of your cash flow. Because the faster I grow, I may have to order in more inventory, but if I'm not getting paid in a timely manner, how am I going to pay for that inventory? The rules of governing the cash flow statement is that cash inflows must be recorded in the accounting period during when cash was received. Cash outflows must be recorded in the accounting period which cash was expended. Pretty simple. Sales tax. Record the state sales tax that must be paid is based on customer purchases. Sales tax can be computed for each customer transaction. And you will use pharmacy uh, software. Your point of sale system will help you do this because you will have to make sure you're paying sales tax and where it's due. You can be audit audited by the state on your sales tax revenue. And once again, finding a good accountant, is you're not going to be left in the dark on this. They're going to help guide you through this. Your cash flow statement statement must cover all transactions that involve cash. The beginning cash position for a startup venture is always set at zero dollars in year one and that net change will change from year to year. The end of a fiscal year the ending balance is next year's beginning balance. One of the most common mistakes by an inexperienced entrepreneur is under capitalization of your venture and that is why you do a business plan because you may need to get a line of credit to help offset your cash flow needs during those difficult times. That's why you will determine too that this course and next year's course, semester's course, is designed to help you think about your future, five years into the future, ten years in the future, of how much money do I need to stash away to help me get through the initial lean times. The cash flow statement provides an objective means for determining a new venture startup of cash needs. Determine the money a business needs at startup. The greater the entrepreneur's experience in the industry, the greater the amount of research that underlies cash flow statement projections. Finally, the last set of financials, the cash, the balance sheet. The balance sheet records the capital position of the company. It's just for operational results. The, a balance sheet reflects the status of the business at a point of time. It's called a balance sheet because its two major parts must balance a fundamental accounting equation. Your assets will equal your liabilities plus your owner's equity. The balance sheet is always a snapshot of your business at a particular time. A series of balance sheets is needed to correct, analyze the condition of a company. Sometimes venture balance sheets indicates the possibility of serious problems on the horizon. And we'll talk about that when we talk about financial ratios. The purpose of a balance sheet is to 
support the financial position of an accounting entity at a particular point in time. The basic format for a balance sheet is assets equal liabilities plus equity. Major headings on a balance sheet include assets, and they're listed in the order of their liquidity. What does that mean? The, the quickness that you can convert what you own into cash. Current assets can be converted into cash within one year. Cash is the first asset listed. Two additional current assets that are usually are accounts receivable, what we're getting you know, paid by insurances, and our inventory. Fixed assets not expected to be available as liquid assets in less than a year. Many of these fixed assets are depreciated, such as computers. Other assets are the final category include assets and capitalized expenses not used in daily business but not yet charged off to expenses. So assets are economic resources owned by the company. Those can include cash, accounts receivable, supplies, build the building, you may own the building and the equipment. Your liabilities, debts that you owe creditors. Types of liabilities are listed on the balance sheet, current and long term. Owner's equity represents the claims of the owner's partners and shareholders against the firm's assets. A firm's profits can be either dis distributed as dividends to shareholders or retained and reinvested in the firm. So let's take a look at liabilities. They're your debt obligations. Examples are accounts payable, who you owe, like your wholesaler, unearned revenues, all right, bonds payable, your loans to the bank. Equity is the residual balance. So when I take away what I own minus what I owe, this is my equity. Think about a home, all right? All of you hopefully may someday become homeowners. And when you purchase a home, you may put 20% down. So if I had a $100,000 house, I'm going to put $20,000 down. Over time, that remaining $80,000 is owed by the bank. Over time, the more you pay down on that, you take what the bank owes, all right? You take what the you still owe the bank, and eventually, you know, your equity is going to increase. And so, for example, you may only have $20,000 in equity because that's the $20,000 you put down. But the more you pay down on it, you the more you own it. So then when you go to selling of a business or selling of a house, that is what you may reap based upon what the market value bears. There are two different types of assets shown on the balance sheet. I told you there's the current assets and the non-current assets. Current assets are those assets that will be used and turned to cash within one year. Those are accounts receivable, inventory, short-term investments, supplies. Non-current assets are long-term investments, land, building, equipments. There are two different types of liabilities, current liabilities and long-term liabilities. Current liabilities are obligations that will be paid in cash or satisfied by providing a service within the coming year. Examples include accounts payable, short-term notes payable, and taxes payable. Long-term liabilities are obligations that will not be paid or satisfied with one year. They include mortgages and bonds. Stockholders' equity is divided into two categories, contributed capital and retained earnings. So if you have multiple partners, you may form you know, a company where that, you know, what do you pay out to each other? What do you put back into the business? Contributed capital is the amount of cash or assets provided by the shareholders. And so somebody who wants to maybe be a partner in your company buy, pays in so much capital. Retained earnings are the total earnings that have not been distributed to the owners or yourself as an owner, and you're giving back to the company. So your current, you know, so you've got your total assets, your total liabilities, and your equity. And so how do we prepare all these? First, we prepare the income statement. The net income, all right, then that goes over to the cash flow statement. And the end retained earnings, that goes over to the balance sheet. So the income statement in review is a summary of the revenue and expenses for a specific period of time. The statement of retained earnings, the cash flow sheet, is a summary of the changes that have occurred during a specific period of time. And the balance sheet it shows what your assets and liabilities and your owner's equity at a specific date. So let's take a look at this person's business. Okay? And let's classify assets, liabilities, revenues, or expenses. So here's assets. Cash, 
supplies, inventories, accounts receivable, and buildings. Remember, accounts receivable in our business is usually payment by third-party payers. Liabilities, accounts payable, what we pay our wholesaler, bonds payable, loans that we have to pay. Equity is you know, the common stock we now own in our business, retained earnings that we may put back into the business, additional paid in capital, uh, uh, you know, things that we own, fixed assets. And then, obviously, we also have revenue, and that is our sales. And then we have our expenses, such as utility, interest, salaries, cost of goods, sales, and supplies. And so, here's another showing us preparing the income statement. So here's our operating expenses, utilities, salaries, and supplies. Here's our non-operating items, such as interest to our loans. There's our income tax we have to pay. So then we look at the balance sheet. All right. So if you take a look back here, our net income was seven thousand. So our beginning retained earnings. If we were a starting business at zero, but from last year we had five thousand retained earnings. We now have seven thousand. So our ended balance, and if we didn't pay out any dividends, our ended balance is twelve thousand within the company. To prepare our balance sheet, we look at our current assets and liabilities. So current assets. End of the balance is brought forward from the statement of retained earnings. That's $12,000. And, you know, if you take a look at our other assets, we have our cash, our accounts receivable, and non-current assets, our buildings, our stockholders' equities, common stock, and our long-term liabilities as bonds payable. We are going to have another lecture, which is going to help you apply these principles of understanding these different statements but we're going to look at the last thing is called financial ratio analysis and financial ratio analysis consists of taking these statements and being able to compare from year to year and using reports such as the NCPA digest to see how we are doing financially and the major areas of ratio analysis are the following. We're going to look at solvency of our company, efficiency of our company, and profitability of our company. Solvency means the overall ability of us being able to pay our legal debts. Efficiency is how well we're using the capital we have. Profitability is a lot of times considered the bottom line. It measures is one of the measures of the of our success. So let's look at how do we measure solvency. So if you take a look at this ratio, it's called the current ratio. The current ratio takes our current assets divided by our current liabilities. And just like your own personal income, you want to be able to bring to own more than what you owe. So that usual range to show a good healthy company should be two to one. An asset test ratio, which also can be known as a quick ratio, takes your cash plus your accounts receivable divided by your current liabilities. And, you know, obviously greater would be better, but a one to one actually shows. Sometimes, though, banks are good with this all the way up to about 3.8 to 1. Anything above 3.8 to 1 shows that we may not be reinvesting into our company and we have to. Uh, Make sure we're doing that to keep our company fresh and viable. Another solvency ratio is looking at what your editing inventory is at the end of the year divided by your current liabilities, and that should be less than 50%. Remember, inventory on your shelf is considered just like cash that you have not used. Total liabilities divided by net worth, that should be less than 100%. So obviously, you don't want your liabilities to be more than what you're worth. Another thing is we look at fixed assets divided by net worth, and this usually range between 25 to 50%, and long-term debt over a net worth and capital that's less than 50%. I did provide you several good chapters that come from a book by Norman Carroll called Financial for Pharmacists. I do encourage you to read these chapters this week and um, being able to uh, be prepared for our, our next lecture of how do we manage these. The definition of efficiency is looking at a couple of things. 
how often we're turning over our inventory compared to ourselves. So one of the ways we could do that is we look at cost of goods sold divided by our average inventory. We look at our annual sales divided by average inventory. The definition and usual range of efficiency ratios. We look at our current assets minus our current liabilities, our net working capital. Our net working capital turnover, we look at our annual sales divided by our net working capital. So it's looking at how much are we using our resources compared to our sales. That usual range should be 5 to 12. The other thing is we have to make sure when do we need to think about reinvesting. And so we may look at, you know, how well our newness of our fixed assets are in based on depreciation. Other things is how often are we, um, you know, getting paid. So our accounts receivable divided by the, that year. So we should be getting paid every 30 or 40 days. The other thing is how, how quick are we paying those we owe. That should be within 15 to 25 days because anything beyond 30 days, we're usually having to pay interest. And sometimes we may get discounts if we pay our bill earlier. Profitability is a pretty easy ratio to determine. You take your net profit over your annual sales, and for a community pharmacy, that usually ranges between 3 to 8 percent. Return on our net worth equals net profit divided by net worth, and that usual range is between 20 to 30 percent. Other profitability ratios, looking at our net profit to our total assets, our net profit to our inventory, and our net profit to our, our, our you know, working capital. So what we discussed today is just putting your toe into the water of financial management. And trust me, listening to this lecture the first time, you're not going to get it completely. It takes time. What I encourage you to do is watch this video, read the articles, and I will then be in the near future posting other things for you to listen, to read, and eventually we'll be doing an exercise on financial management. I thank you very much for your time, and please feel free to email me anytime with any questions. Thank you.